On several occasions, the Prophet Joseph Smith stayed in the home of Josiah Stoll, located near the Susquehanna River, just southwest of the village of South Bainbridge. While here, Joseph discussed his spiritual experiences, Josiah's Spanish silver mine project, and his own desire to marry Emma Hale, who also visited here. Since 1829, this home has been modernized several times and now has been restored to some of its original condition. It appears around 1825 that uh, Josiah Stoll had some interest in uh, kind of a uh, get-rich-quick uh, scheme. Uh, there were reports that uh, down in Harmony, Pennsylvania, that uh, there was a Spanish treasure, Spanish treasure mine, and uh, Stoll uh, concocted the idea, well, perhaps uh, this Joseph Smith, who has these unique abilities, uh, could help me locate that treasure. Joseph Smith uh, agreed to help Josiah Stoll, along with his father and a few of the neighbors. Uh, Joseph's probably doing it not so much to try to help Stowell, but to help the family. Uh, we know coming due is a major mortgage payment, and uh, the Smiths needed this money uh, desperately. So the contract was struck, and uh, Joseph reported down uh, around the 1st of November uh, in, uh, to, to Josiah Stowell's home. Uh, at the same time, Stowell had made a, uh, an agreement with Isaac Hale, who was a hunter in the area of uh, Harmony, Pennsylvania, to actually put these uh, men up as they try to locate the purported treasure. Uh, it was at this time, of course, that Joseph will board uh, and, and his companions in the uh, Isaac Hale home. And of course, uh, he meets his uh, future wife, Emma Hale. After convincing Mr. Stoll to abandon his search for Spanish silver, Joseph worked on Josiah's farm. Later, Joseph and Emma stayed here for a brief time, immediately following their marriage. Josiah Stoll believed in Joseph to the last, saying that he never knew anything of him but that was right, and also knew Joseph was a seer and a prophet, and that the Book of Mormon was true. Another uh, item in which Josiah Stoll is uh, involved deals with a attempt to go uh, secure or sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon in Toronto, Canada. So what took place, it's, it's called the 23rd Commandment in what was to be the Book of Commandments. And along with Oliver Cowdery and Hiram Page, Josiah Stoll is specifically mentioned to go up into the area of Canada so that they can secure copyright for this book in the entire world. As they uh, go to Canada, they go to Kingston area, and then what was known as York, which is modern day Toronto. And we find that Josiah Stoll in 1830, that's all we have is a revelation from 1830, is still very much involved with the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to all lands. During one of her visits to the Stowell home in South Bainbridge, Emma and Joseph decided to marry without her parents' permission. According to Lucy Mack Smith, more than a year before the wedding, Joseph shared with his parents his desire to marry Emma. He thought that no young woman that he ever was acquainted with was better calculated to render the man of her choice happy than Emma Hale, a young lady whom he had been extremely fond of since his first introduction to her. For Joseph, it's love at first sight. He is completely mesmerized with her. And I think he felt that she may have been a little bit out of his league. She's older, she's uh, been a school teacher, and she's definitely more educated than he is. 
I think she, uh, she was quite taken with him also. The problem, I think, was that Joseph's reputation had preceded him. He came uh, being known as uh, a money digger, as one who was talking about angels and gold Bibles. And uh, you can imagine a father-in-law, future father-in-law, uh, the prospects of Joseph uh, supporting a wife were not uh, extremely positive. Joseph later wrote, Owing to my continuing to assert that I had seen a vision, persecution still followed me, and my wife's father's family were very much opposed to our being married. I was therefore under that necessity of taking her elsewhere. So we went and were married at the house of Squire Tarbell. Emma later related the story to her son, saying, I had no intention of marrying when I left home. But during my visit at Mr. Stoll, Joseph visited me there. My folks were bitterly opposed to him, and being importuned by your father, aided by Mr. Stoll, who urged me to marry him, and preferring to marry him to any other man, I consented. The Zachariah Tarbell home was located here on the Afton County Fairgrounds. This mantle from the Tarbell home is now preserved in the home of a local Afton resident. Uh, this mantelpiece was from the, what we called the Mormon house on the Afton fairgrounds. It was where the Justice of the Peace, Zechariah Tarbell, lived. And he was the justice who married Joseph Smith and Emma Hale in 1827. The house was used as a exhibition hall and dining hall for the Afton Fair every year, but it got to be in a state of disrepair, and so my father went and bought two mantelpieces, this one here and the one that is in the museum barn in Afton. Today, an historical marker on the site of the Tarbell home, erected in 1932 by the New York State Department of Education, mistakenly identifies Emma as Emily Hill. A probable location of the court trial held against the Prophet Joseph Smith in Broome County, New York, is the Nathaniel Cole Tavern. Remnants of the foundation of the tavern are found here in Harpersville, New York. In operation by 1800, it was located near the corner of what now is Colesville Road and Watrous Road. The post office, established here in 1806 with Nathaniel Cole Sr. as the first postmaster, was evidently at the right rear of the building. A local resident, Mrs. Daisy Hurd Decker, recalled that the front door opened into a large front hall with a wide staircase which ended in a huge ballroom across the front of the building with windows in front and ends and doors opening into the bedrooms on the back. In 19th century America, you, you have these uh, taverns in communities. Today in our day, we think of them as drinking spots or something like that, but in the in the earlier days, these taverns were literally community centers. Uh, people would go there to uh, uh, hold court, as in the case with Joseph Smith at Cole's Tavern. Uh, people would come there for dances, for recreation, other things like that. It's almost as if uh, taverns have evolved now in the 20th, 21st centuries into uh, uh, quite respectable places. If you think about it, even our church cultural halls are, are have become community centers. When we first built our chapels, why, they were uh, almost 
Protestantish uh, buildings with pews and a pulpit at the front. Then we began adding these cultural halls to them, and we have what we have today, and our churches uh, uh, literally become places where we can dance and we can have fun and we can put on programs and things like that. The Prophet Joseph Smith related that in June 1830, the evening after his acquittal in South Bainbridge, he was immediately taken by a constable to a tavern in nearby Broome County for trial there. The next day, a trial was held before a magistrate. It's an interesting trial. We don't know a lot about it, but it was brought uh, forward by a man by the name of Peter Bridgman. Uh, Peter Bridgman was the nephew of Josiah Stoll. Uh, off his wife, uh, uh, Josiah Stoll's wife, Miriam, uh, was on her side of the family. And uh, Peter Bridgman uh, charges Joseph Smith with uh, being a glass looker and a disorderly person. We don't know much about the hearing uh, and really what went on. There's a, a small, uh, small amount of records there to kind of piece things together. But it is interesting uh, that in the court hearing uh, that uh, Josiah Stoll uh, came as really a defense witness for Joseph Smith. And basically he said that... Um, I believe in him, that he has uh, unique uh, spiritual uh, capabilities and, and uh, uh, Josiah Stoll puts his stamp of endorsement on Joseph Smith as a, as a prophet and seer. John Reed, one of Joseph's attorneys, related, Whilst I was engaged in the case, I was inspired with an eloquence which was altogether new to me and which was overpowering and irresistible. I succeeded as I expected in obtaining the prisoner's discharge. The, the charge is vagrancy, and the individual who's being charged is Joseph Smith, the glass looker, or Joseph Smith, the imposter. And so he's not being taken to court to, to see if he really is a glass looker or if he is an imposter, uh, it's whether he's a vagrant. And they're using these derogatory terms, the glass looker, and trying to sway the court with a character assassination. So that even though this isn't a, a very uh, solid charge that he's a vagrant, because that doesn't make any sense at all. He's there working for Josiah Stoll. So how's he a vagrant? But that doesn't matter because what our real concern is is he's a glass looker or he's an imposter, which they can't prove anyway, or it's just a derogatory term to say Joseph has gifts of seership. Joseph was acquitted and even the abusive constable apologized to Joseph and asked his forgiveness. The mob persisted, however, and the constable eventually helped Joseph escape to safety. Stoll's constantly coming to the aid of Joseph Smith in terms of uh, particularly character, uh, his character reference to show that, hey, this is indeed a remarkable, remarkable person, regardless of whatever uh, uh, rumors have been circulating. I know this young man, and, uh, and he's, uh, he's uh, a noble character. 